आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Hello and welcome to another edition of Living on the Edge. This week we expose the unholy nexus that makes illegal slaughter possible in the capital. Explore career possibilities in environment and see how worms do their little bit for conservation. S Prabhakaran of Cochin says he's a regular viewer of our program and has a story idea for us. Your sincere effort to highlight environmental problems through this prestigious program is well appreciated and I wish you all success. I would like you to do a story on unauthorized and illegal slaughter houses in which thousands of animals are killed every day. Manish Gupta of Delhi says, "I must congratulate you for this TV program. This is the first time I'm writing a letter to any TV program. I want to draw your attention to the cruelty against animals in Pashu Ghar in New Delhi. This creates a lot of pollution and can lead to hazardous diseases. It can also affect the health and minds of children." Manish in response to your letter Shonar Joshi visited the areas you mentioned and brought back this horrifying report This is Kasabpura home to 50000 people most of whom are connected to Delhi slaughter trade It was supposed to be a residential colony but now behind the doors of virtually every home illegal slaughtering takes place to cater to Delhi's ever increasing need for meat An estimated 10000 animals are done to death here every day The reason is simple. It's to circumvent the Supreme Court ruling of March 18, 1994 that limited the number of animals killed in the Delhi Eidgah slaughterhouse to 500 buffaloes and 2000 sheep or goats. The ruling came in the wake of a petition moved by Menaka Gandhi calling for closure of the slaughterhouse on the grounds that animals were being done to death in unhygienic and barbaric conditions. In response to the Supreme Court ruling, the butchers went on strike for 3 months. The price of meat skyrocketed and illegal slaughtering began. Butchers say what's happening in Kasapura is a desperate attempt to secure their livelihood after the ruling rendered most of their jobs obsolete. Jab insaan ko roti nahi milegi, when a man does not get his food, he will do anything to avoid hunger. At least the men doing this work are not stealing, robbing or dealing in drugs. They are simply feeding themselves. Wo afim charas nahi bech rahe. At least wo apne pet ko pal rahe. At the heart of the problem is the new quota system. Only butchers who are allotted slips by the authorities can slaughter legally. With the reduction in number of animals being killed under the ruling, it's obvious that hundreds of butchers will be out of work. Sabse badi musibat ye hai The biggest problem is that after the reduction the slip system has come about slips are issued for 500 buffaloes and 2000 sheep the men are 10000 now how does one distribute them there are fights every day those who get the slips are happy as they get to slaughter but what do the others do limited log mehdood ho gaye jinko parchi mil jati hai wo to khush ho gaye wahan karna ab jisko parchi mil le wo kare kya what they do is take advantage of delhi's insatiable non vegetarian appetite The court may have introduced a quota system but they can't regulate demand which far outstrips the supply available legally. The question of demand and supply. Because there is demand people are tempted to slaughter animals uh, illegally and uh, when they do that it is much more cruel uh, done in much more cruel form uh, with lot of cruelty than uh, done in any slaughterhouse. तो आपको जिस तरीके से वो मारे जाते हैं डोंट यू फील सिक सीइंग देम स्लॉटर्ड नो ओनली दोस फील सिक हु हैव अ वीक हार्ट और सफर फ्रॉम हार्ट डिजीज हार्ट अटैक हो या दिल का मरीज हो उनको घिनाती है ये सृष्टि में किस लिए आते हैं व्हाई डू दे कम इन दिस वर्ल्ड इफ दे हैड अनदर यूज आई वुड अंडरस्टैंड सिंस दे डोंट वन कैन प्रेज्यूम दैट दे आर मेंट फॉर ईटिंग ये समझते हैं कि ये खाने खाने के लिए बनाए हुए हैं Despite the fact that the number of vegetarians is steadily growing, 
meat still continues to excite the taste buds of a sizable population. But there is more to meat eating than meets the eye, at least in the capital. Living on the edge realized this when our team arrived in Kasapura with a police escort to gauge the extent of illegal slaughter and its consequences on a predominantly residential area. We found an empty street, no trucks, no animals and very few people. This came as a surprise considering what we had seen the previous day and the treatment meted out to us when we had arrived without an escort. It became apparent that the police had tipped off the butchers about our impending arrival, a fact attested to by residents who spoke to us off camera. Everything sells in India, even leaders can be bought. This illegal slaughtering is taking place with the help of the police and with the help of the manager or the superintendent of the slaughterhouse. Whether it is friendship or they're gaining something out of this is left to the speculation of the government. Because of their help, our business is going on and will not stop. Yes, of course, if there is no corruption, then uh, 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 there cannot be any slaughtering uh, outside uh, the slaughterhouse. But there is, a, it shows that there is a huge uh, bribe involved in this whole racket. And so they are, they are doing all this activity in open daylight. Perhaps the most worrying consequence of the unauthorized, unregulated killing that takes place within a stone's throw from the Sadar police station is the magnitude of environmental pollution. These shots only reveal animal remains, swarming with flies and surrounded by scavengers. What you can't experience in your homes is the stench and nausea that overwhelms you and makes your stomach churn. See this water, sometimes there's blood in this as well. The way dirt comes, the blood also comes into it. The problem is that people are staying in unhygienic conditions. My simple question is that who is responsible for all these problems? That question will go unanswered because all our attempts to speak to the concerned authorities were rebuffed. As the filth increases and diseases spread, one issue has become obscured and nobody talks about it anymore. The Supreme Court had tried to address it by reducing the number of animals that face the blade and by asking for modern techniques to be employed. It's the whole question of cruelty to animals who will become our food. Starving, thirsty and barely alive, these animals are dead meat even before they finally succumb. We still haven't been able to evolve painless methods of slaughter even the infamous state-of-the-art slaughterhouse outside Hyderabad hasn't been able to do this. Butchers just follow the methods their forefathers used as it's still a hereditary occupation. Painless death is not a priority, turnover is. They see slaughtering taking place and say there's so much cruelty, but they don't see the problem. There are people who can only slaughter and nothing besides that. That the butchers have, they are, they, there is a problem with them also. I mean, they have been butchers for say two generations or three generations. Suddenly they cannot change over to being a tailor or being a teacher or something. Maybe that's why a government scheme to resettle unemployed butchers has not been very successful. Only 20 have signed up so far to learn new occupations. What can the government give us? The government can't give us anything. If they can feed themselves and give their own people jobs, I'll believe you. I guarantee that our entire clan will leave this occupation. And because the occupation involves much more than just killing, it's quite lucrative. Here's what a dead animal is really worth. Edible byproducts, blood, meat, tongue, heart, liver, brains, casings, bones, gelatin. Non-edible byproducts, bile, hormones, glands, fertilizers, feeds, glue, leather, hides and skins, gastrointestinal contents. You may not be able to buy all this at your local meat shop, but you can surely pick up heads, claws, feet, brains, intestines and hooves outside your local abattoir. In the capital, however, the Supreme Court restriction on slaughter has curtailed this trade, though not completely. There's no place to sit and no shade. There are worms everywhere. This slaughterhouse even has no space for setting up a treatment plant. In 1987, 
the Central Pollution Control Board directed this slaughterhouse, uh, this municipal corporation of Delhi to set up a slaughterhouse. They did not do it. Neither they uh, closed down uh, the slaughterhouse, nor they set up a uh, this treatment plant over there. So, this is the behavior of the corporation whose primary job is to see that the citizens health uh, is paramount. Even more shocking is the presence of the Eidka Government Girls School next to the slaughterhouse. Birds of prey hover over the school. Piteous cries of animals rent the atmosphere and blood and gore are as much a part of the school curriculum as learning itself. I feel sick. There is so much blood. We feel nauseated looking at it. In the morning we can hear their shrieks and find it hard to concentrate. During lunch we can't eat and feel sick as well. Is it any wonder then that the residents have reached the end of their tether? Those who thought the Supreme Court decision would help find that things have gone from bad to worse. This is a profession. If the government can't make provisions, then it doesn't have any right to stop us either. If it has a complaint against our occupation, it is their duty to provide us more space. For whatever it's worth, the Supreme Court has set 31st December 1995 as the date for the slaughterhouse to be moved to a more conducive area. By now it's clear that as long as there's a demand for meat, the supply will continue whether it's from Kasapura or neighboring towns and cities. It's only when a modernized slaughterhouse, preferably on the outskirts of Delhi, becomes a reality that the needs of the consumer and those who survive on the trade will be met. The question is, are the authorities equal to the task? You make it here or outside, our people are ready to go out. But until you do that, this illegal slaughterhouse will not stop. Long live the police, long live the corporation, long live the manager superintendent of the slaughterhouse. Manager slaughterhouse or superintendent of slaughterhouse in Dabad. That story probably made disturbing viewing, though we tried to reduce graphic visuals to the minimum. We've received many letters from viewers who want to explore the possibility of an environment-related career. S.S. Swami of Bhimavaram says, I'm a regular viewer of your program. I was inspired by your program and got a postgraduate diploma in industrial pollution management from an environmental protection society. As a civil engineering graduate, I know very little about our environment, but your program has enlightened us. For all those like Swami who wish to explore the possibility of an environment-related career, Here's Tisha Srivastava to show you that the opportunities are endless. Are these some of the vague impressions that surface when someone mentions the word environmentalist? Is this why anything enviro is seen more as a hobby or social service at best? Anything but a career option. And yet if you feel strongly about issues like cruelty to animals, as your letters show, there's plenty you can do. You could write about it and make citizens aware. You can help fight it in the courts. You could do in-depth research to understand all the issues involved, or help mobilize funds, or help market alternatives. And each of these could become a serious career today if you are interested. We are going to show you how you can make environment a source of livelihood and a way of life. But the first notion we'd like to dispel is that all serious environmental careers are science intensive. Environmental problems are primarily social problems, they're not technological problems. Technology helps, but that's secondary. That uh, the social sciences become actually a very, very relevant, very important field and opening out tremendously again. A historian could look at the history, say, of the last 300 years of forest use in India 
because out of that history of what has happened say during colonial times and then post independence time and so on and so forth will come the answers of what to do against deforestation okay you'd need to do anthropological work to understand how local societies have related to their water resources and their forests and, and their wildlife and so on. we are economic students as art students and we can't do post grad in environmental sciences and there's no such thing as environmental economics especially in india okay. so we want a point of view that is absolutely new as the tigers and elephants get few and few these are only a few of the academic and research options open to you if you prefer something more dynamic let your imagination run riot as a young group of communicators with a graphic art background did and formed people tree people tree is an umbrella organization that brings together oddballs experimenting with natural dyes on t-shirts makers of recycled rag wallets and cosmetics that are not tested on animals and even in viral comics what's more it's a financially viable niche market so if you think that your particular skill can lead to an environment friendly way of life take that extra initiative another area that you could be looking at is the ngo sector this is where the maximum work and growth has taken place over the past decade like wwf tata energy research institute There are over 5000 NGOs in the country today working on fields as diverse as wildlife and environmental education on the one hand to ornithology and auditing on the other Most of these receive funding from project to project and are financially feasible as careers An NGO directory is available with WWF and you can contact the ones in your area And if the issue is localized you could form your own NGO as Bharti Chaturvedi a post graduate in history interested in yeah. solid waste management has so the first thing is not to be bogged down by enviro courses at least don't let it ever make you feel inadequate and then i think the second crucial thing is interest so you should work where your interest takes you if you have enough people and if you can get funding it's well worth in your own small area starting to work we look at techniques and uh, composting and in lot of colonies where helping in delhi colonies were helping people to uh, handle their own garbage if opportunities are what you're looking for consider environmental communications both at the national and state level those who want to write or illustrate or design messages have ample opportunities today then an ngo like center for science and environment is doing pioneering work in objective documentation for instance how do you put a value to forests They've undertaken it as a project study and are evaluating it in resource economic terms. They have a popular environmental publication, Down to Earth, which you could write to. Why do you say that uh, you don't want to have this as a full-time career? Because I feel people who are working with voluntary organizations can do a lot. but uh, i feel in the world power matters being something matters say for students who think this way environmental law where the courts are used to wage a fight against the wrongdoers is an option example the taj mahal as we knew it would have continued to be a pale smoggy shadow of its exquisite self had mc mehta not fought to save it and the people of agra when i filed these cases in the supreme court like taj mahal case when i filed in 1984 nobody could say that this case is going to save the taj mahal and this case went on and in 1992 i succeeded in getting orders from the supreme court for the closure of 212 industries with environment impact assessment of any project becoming mandatory and the setting up of the national environmental tribunals environment is ready to evolve into an industry with varied facets to it rather than just a technology driven mission talking of which here's a list of some eminent institutions besides the iits which offer courses in environment and related scientific disciplines Thank you.
There are many more institutions we hope to cover in the future. To learn about job opportunities, you need to contact the universities directly as the scene changes every year. But the most important thing is that you've got to believe you can make a difference to our way of life and that you can live and live well by it, whatever your skill or whatever your interest. Many of you have written to us asking what you can do to help protect our environment. Sanjay Das of Burdwan, West Bengal writes, I am a regular viewer of your program. Please show us how garbage can be recycled. Our next story takes you to Madras where worms, yes ordinary earthworms, are used to decompose garbage. The method is simple and effective and is something all of us can do in our homes. Priya Somaya shows you how. It is said that a city dweller creates about half a kilogram of garbage every day. This adds up to a frighteningly large amount when you think of the number of citizens living in urban areas. Only too frequently, it lies uncollected in dumps in our localities or piles up in huge landfill sites like this one. When subjected to stench and filth, we are quick to blame city municipalities for not doing their job effectively. To a certain extent, this is true. But even the corporation finds it difficult to deal with the sheer quantity of garbage. Perhaps that's why more and more groups are taking things into their own hands. Normally we talk about that man has passed through the, the, the Stone Age and the um, Bronze Age. From there he landed up to the Space Age and today he is in garbage. Now this garbage is his, his own making. The, the, the volume of garbage will definitely keep increasing because everything that is being generated is being thrown out. Most of our household garbage consists of decomposable matter like kitchen waste. The rest of it is plastic and other materials that cannot decompose, at least not over a limited period. Well, Professor Ishmael and his students have tapped on an age-old wisdom to recycle organic garbage. Believe it or not, they use earthworms that we find in our backyards or gardens to convert garbage into useful manure. And yes, it's something we can all do in our very homes. All you need is a plastic container or a bucket, gravel, sand, good topsoil, fresh cow dung, dry hay, water, a handful of earthworms and a little initiative. Here's how you can go about putting together an eco bin where your garbage can be converted into manure. Gravel or broken bricks form the first layer. This is covered with sand and then some good topsoil up to 12 centimeters of it. This is when earthworms are added. Two things might bother you. For one, Worms conjure up images of something creepy and crawly. But if you overcome your initial revulsion, you'll see that they're not too repulsive, as these students found. Secondly, you'd wonder where you could find these worms to start with in this concrete jungle. In case they are not able to get a good quality of worms or a quantity of worms, for example, then in a shady place beneath a tree, where no chemicals have been added, in such a place if they can put a little bit of cow dung and hay, cover it up with a jute bag not plastic and keep watering every day. After about 10 to 15 days, when they move that region, they will find a lot of worms. These earthworms should then be introduced into the soil in the eco bin. Lumps of cow dung are now added. This is covered with hay and water is put into the bin daily. This happens for a month. And on the 31st day, you can start adding organic or kitchen waste that is generated at home every day. Remember, regular mixing of soil and garbage helps. 45 days after the last addition of waste, your garbage would have been converted to manure. It doesn't smell and once dried can be used in your kitchen garden or in potted plants. In fact, it's so simple that almost every household in this colony in Madras has adopted it. At the end of the day, no garbage is generated, only useful manure. Earlier on, we used to throw all our uh, rubbish and everything out and on the road, you know. And uh, re corporation people were not able to clear it regularly. So it has become a major problem and uh, we living in a residential area, we like to have ourselves clean. I started doing vermipit and I used to handle with my own hand. No smell, no flies are there. No mosquitoes. Uh, actually, my pit is uh, behind my bedroom. Uh, nothing like that. Anybody can use this. Very simple technology. 
This technique is now being taught in schools so that children can try it at home. Just putting uh, the waste in uh, dumping uh, garbage cans, etc. it's not enough because it creates a lot of pollution and stink smell, foul smell, so it's, it's actually unhealthy for the environment. So by doing this, uh, the stink goes because it's immediately degraded. And we're also able to get biomine which can be used for plants as a manure. So if you are fed up with the garbage that lies uncleared near your home or are revulsed by overfilled municipal bins, then do your bit. Start your own eco bin so that no waste leaves your home. The Amazon rainforests in Brazil are being cleared at the rate of 40,500 hectares a day to create pastures for beef cattle exported to the US.